Where I'd like to start, though, Michael, is, is if I may, is, is with the concept of youth in politics. Because one of the things when I was collecting these essays together and looking at the common themes, which struck me very forcibly, is that most people who get to the top in politics start very young. They become seriously interested in politics in their teens. They mostly either get elected to their first public office by the age of 30. It's what I call in the book the Club of 30. Almost all those people who reach the top of politics have <laughs> first been elected to their first public office by the age of 30, or they have stood for office by the age of 30, and if the cards had fallen slightly differently, might have got in. Uh, president Biden, who has the distinction of being the oldest president of the United States, was first elected to his local council in Delaware at the age of 27. He stood for the Senate at the age of 29. When he was elected at the age of 29, he was too young to take office, but because Inauguration Day fell between the election and after his birthday, he took office as the youngest senator in the history of the Senate. Now, it took him a while to reach the top. He's now, the, uh, he's now um, in his late 70s, but he's wanted to be president and has been equipping himself for the job ever since. So I applied this uh, test to um, Lord Heseltine. And Michael will tell us in a, in a moment when he first started becoming seriously interested in politics. But if you look at his career, he was president of the Oxford Union, clearly very committed to a career in politics from his early 20s. I think you first stood in Gower at the age of 26 in yes. your first election. Yeah. Uh, that was then a safe-ish safe Labour seat. Oh, yeah. 17,000 Labour majority. So even, even Michael didn't think he could overturn that in, in one election. But then you stood in the 1964 election at the age of 31 for a marginal seat, Covent Coventry, Coventry, Coventry North, seats. yes which you could conceivably have won if it had been a good Tory year, but it was... That's, I thought we were going to fight a, a European election, um, which we didn't. And uh, uh, so, I mean, it, it was just a run-of-the-mill Labour Party held a right. seat comfortably. Right. But I was then adopted two, a year later for safe Tory seat. Right. Which you then got at the age of 33. Yes. So do you, do you want to begin by telling us this, what your reflections are on how political careers start and whether youth and youthful engagement and activity is an indispensable part of, of rising to the top? Well, my first instinct is that there are no generalisations that ever work in politics. So there's always so many exceptions that uh, people who say this is the rule, it, it's just not like that. But uh, as you were introducing me, a thought occurred. Get to my age and people start asking for your advice. And um, it's quite a common statement for someone to say, I'm thinking of going into politics, what do you think? To which I say, don't do it. Because if you're only thinking about it, you're not going to stay the course. It's too tough a job, it's too demanding, and you have got to be so committed that you wouldn't be wandering around asking, saying, I'm thinking of doing it. You already know you have to do it. And um, I think the other aspect that occurred to me is when you said about the youth, fine, get involved, because you can't help yourself as early as you feel you've got an opportunity or a role. But try and do something else as well, because the, the, the most important thing in democratic activity is to have some sort of experience that you bring to the jobs that you've got. And without any doubt at all, my experience in starting a small business and running a, 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 a company of my own made a, a huge impact on the role that I was able to play in running a government department. Um, now, the last thing I would argue is that everybody should come from the private sector or from the business world or anything like that. I believe that the point of parliamentary democracy is to create a, a gathering from every walk of life and every age group and every uh, other serious composing element of society so that there is a genuine representation of all these uh, uh, facets of modern life in Parliament. Um, but so my advice would be where you start, build up a position so that when you talk, you talk with authority, 
on the subject about which you're talking. You talk with the experience of someone who has actually done it, as opposed to just listen to somebody else who's done it. But when it, take us back to your teens. When you said that to do politics, you've got to really want to do it, and I completely agree with that. If you're thinking about it, it's not going to work. At what age did you really want to do it? Did you know that you really wanted yes. to oh, do no, it? Yes, oh no, I can, I, uh, some, someone once wrote in a report, when, and I think when I first got into the House of Commons, that I knew you'd do it uh, when I taught you maths at the age of seven. Well, that was very perceptive of me, but it never occurred to me, that, and I didn't come from a political background. What I do remember quite vividly is the 1951 general election campaign when I was uh, on my way down one of the main streets in Swansea to meet my friends for coffee, which is what we did. And uh, I saw on the other side of the road uh, Conservative headquarters, Henry Kirby, candidate, and I crossed the road and said, can I help? Ten days later, I went up as a new undergraduate to Oxford, and the day I got there, I joined the University Conservative Association, the City of Oxford Conservative Association, and the Oxford Union. So, without being able to explain to you why I did it, I know exactly when I did it. And from that moment on, I have been a member of the Conservative Party. Was there politics in your family? No. So it was, there, was, there was no, as you look back on it, it was... My father chaired one or two of the meetings in that general election campaign in 1951, but he didn't do that as someone, he was quite a well-known local figure, um, and he did it in that context as opposed to coming from a party political background. To my knowledge, I never heard him or saw him speak as a Conservative, although he did tell me something interesting, that he was the only officer in his mess in 1945 who voted Conservative. And he was, he was uh, not a line regiment, he was a corps, the, the Royal Engineers. So that, is, that tells you something about the Labour victory of 1945, which has always been a, in some significant way attributed to the armed forces who wanted change. Well, if the officers in a mess mm. are going to vote Labour on that proportion, mm. it tells you something. Mm. So that's the 1951 when you yes. went up to Oxford. You served under three prime ministers and you've observed many others since 1951. The three you served under, John Major, Margaret Thatcher and Ted Heath, what are your thoughts as you looked at them and uh, to some extent learnt from the others about what it takes to, uh, to be a Prime Minister and a leader? Well, I, I think that you, you have to start earlier than that because by the time I had um, uh, the opportunity to work in Ted's government, I had already um, got to know a little Harold Macmillan, and I had certainly um, been around with Churchill and Eden and Hume. Um, so I don't think that one's impression of the job or the sort of people who do it started with Ted Heath, although I, I remember quite vividly uh, to, saying to my wife, you've got to come and listen to this man because this is the future of the Conservative Party. And that would have been um, in, in my very early days in, uh, uh, before I was in the House of Commons. It would have been about 60, 61, something of that sort. Mm. But your reflections on the leaders that you saw as you were starting to make your way up? Churchill? Well, I think the, the interesting thing is, I've often I've articulated this thought before, and, and that they were giants. It, you know, they were such, so much older and so much experienced, and uh, uh, one was so young and inexperienced that somehow the gap between, the, between them and me was unbridgeable, you know, they, they were a different sort of person, <laughs> a different scale of, of human being. But by the time um, one got into the House of Commons and become a, a junior minister in Ted's government, it wasn't like that. And the most dramatic example of it was 
when I left Margaret's government in 19, um, uh, 1986, um, there were a lot of big players, you know, Willie Whitelaw, Quinton Helsham, Peter Carrington. I mean, these were people of very subs great substance, been around a long time. Willie Whitelaw, Peter Carrington, got the military cross in, in the uh, Second World War. Um, when I went back to John Major's cabinet four years later, I, I remember looking at a, a younger generation. I mean, I was this rather old dudder, you know. And these were kids. Uh, I mean, it's a ridiculous parody of the truth, but there's an element of, I'll never forget the experience of realizing of this generational change. Uh, and age and leadership, do you think that the older, because they were quite old leaders, the leaders in the 50s and 60s. Churchill obviously was in his, uh, in his 70s. Macmillan was in his 60s. And then there's a generational change that happens with Howard Wilson in 64. Do you, th do you think age and leadership, there is a, any, any relationship? There's been a trend towards younger leaders, hasn't there, in the last generation? Well, I think that, that, that sounds right. Um, but to me, the big generational change that took place was the wartime experience. When I first went into the House of Commons, it was very common for the means of address to be my honourable and gallant friend. And that meant that the person to whom you were referring had served as an officer in the field. Um, and it was commonplace. And there were, there were people in the House of Commons who'd had the most distinguished uh, uh, war record. I'm not, I'm not just talking about the Willie Whitelaws and the Peter Carringtons, um, uh, but Julian Amory, for example, and Fitzroy MacLean, uh, Lord Delisle and Dudley, VC. Uh, these were people who'd lived in a different sort of world, I mean, a horrific world, uh, 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 but, but a very formative world in this sense that if you're going to sit in a tank with somebody, the social divisions are really not that important. If you've been in a trench overnight in hell conditions, you have an interdependence with the people there, whether you're the commanding officer or whether you're the private. And that relationship, I think, was a very important part of the way that Britain was in the post-war period. It certainly politically, it was of course crucially important because it was the, 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 the end of a three horrendous wars on the continent of Europe and the birth of the absolute determination that it must never happen again. Um, by Margaret's time, Ted had a distinguished war record, by Margaret's time, uh, and that would have been my generation, this experience of togetherness had gone, just never been there. We, you know, we had been brought up in a post-war world. I actually remember the war, but when I was 12, when the war ended, I can see the crowds in Piccadilly Circus now, because I was there on the night of VJ night. Um, but, but one had not had that experience of interdependence that the war had created for its generations. So Margaret represented a generation of conservatives who did not feel that sort of uh, interdependence. And I've often wondered to what extent the uh, decision by Ted Heath not to fight the general election of 1974 in the early part of February, when he would have fought on the who governs straight down the line against the might of the unions, whether he and Peter Carrington, Willie Whitelaw, just couldn't face that sort of civil war type approach within the country because of their experiences. By the time we got to 79, Ted's army, given a second chance, which is what it was.
because the, the cabinet of 79 was Ted's cabinet, with the, without Ted, with Margaret. But we knew what we had to do, and there was no question of uh, trying to find a, a, a conciliatory route through with people like Scargill. One knew there had to be a confrontation, and it would be very difficult and unpleasant. But uh, we had the stomach for it. Looking, looking at your career, Michael, two things that really strike me which are unusual are you're unusually, in terms of the way that you presented yourself as a politician, were unusually partisan whilst being very moderate. You managed to, you managed to inject real dynamism, passion and edge to a position that was basically a fairly centrist position. Uh, my other, I mean, you're one of my political heroes, another one is Roy Jenkins. Roy was uh, probably equally centrist in terms of his political philosophy, but nowhere near so partisan. How did you manage to keep up this greatly great partisan act, including these amazing conference speeches, left, 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 whilst in fact not seeing a huge chasm between yourself and the other side? Well, it was such fun. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was fun, but it was urgent, it was important. I mean, it, I, I don't like the Labour Party or what the Labour Party stood for or what it did it, in, in the, the easy generalisations. I mean, they were going to nationalise everything, they were going to tax us to oblivion, um, and, and they wanted CND and campaign for nuclear disarmament. That, that, those were the headlines. And, and, and so those are my targets. And if sort of moderate and reasonable people like you got in the firing line, well, that's rough luck. <laughs> <laughs> but I had an audience of 4,000 people, yeah. and I had 10 minutes. Is it is it true, by the way, that you uh, sp spent a, a lot, you know, uh, uh, the, the flying doctor, whatever he's called, Hill and others, you studied them very carefully as orators to no. hone your conference? No, no that, <coughs> I think that was in your book, but I think that is, uh, I that, mean, I remember, I remember uh, Chuck It Priestley, Charles Hill's remark of, uh, of the time on the radio. No, but, where, but I did try to learn to speak. And I did this, Julian Pritchley, my great friend at Oxford, a member of Parliament for Aldershot, I think, uh, and a tape recorder here. And uh, um, I would say to him, butterflies, one minute. He would stand up and talk about butterflies for one minute. And then he would turn around and he'd say to me, lollipops. And I had to get up and talk about lollipops. And, you, 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 you know, you can do it if, if you, you know, you, you, you train yourself to do it. The ultimate test was you've got to stand up now for one minute and you must make a speech when you don't give any indication of where you are, what you're talking about, what you've got in your mind. <laughs> and, and I can do that as well. I, I, I can stand up now and I could talk for one minute and you wouldn't know what the hell I was talking about. But it would sound convincing. <laughs> I want to say what an extraordinary privilege it is to be here tonight. As long as I can remember, if there is an audience which I had hoped one day would do me the honour of inviting me to come, yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> You're sounding a bit like Mr. Speaker, who I'm going to bring in, uh, in shortly, who I think can do it in, in, in equal measure. The other characteristic of your career that I, f I find very striking and somewhat unusual is that you weren't only... Uh, a, a master at politics, you're also a master of government. And in my experience, having um, uh, done in a lesser way um, this trade too, there aren't that many politicians who are particularly uh, interested in government and good at it. Uh, you leave a whole set of institutions and great achievements which uh, were, were your work in government. How, do, how, how did you combine and seek to combine the business of being a retail politician but also being a really serious executive leader in government. Well I mentioned very early on my experience of starting a business. You see the first, I mean anyone who's ever started a business you know it's a rocky business. You, 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 make, a, you make a good decision, you make a bit of money, you think you're Croesus and you make some terrible mistakes and you lose all the money and you have terrible nightmares how you pay the bills all that uh, and literally in 1970 uh, when I became uh, junior minister of transport 
The first proposal was put on my desk. Please sign here, Parliamentary Secretary. It's just six million pounds to invest in electrification of a rail line. Three weeks before, I had been authorising every petty cash voucher on over 50p because there weren't many 50ps around. And so I'd arrived in public life, you know. Um, but I had learnt enough about how to manage and get into the detail and to insist on, our, on, on answers and on the need to make decisions and to tell people what to do. So it was in, to, in my private sector upbringing that my first experiences of management came. And of course, it was second nature to turn that into um, the, the political dimension. And it, there's a very topical, I mean, the thing that I'm appalled by it's happening at the moment is the uh, blub, which is now becoming the new excuse for the politicians who don't know how to run things. The blub, have I got the word right? Blob. 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 The civil servants, them, someone else, not me, their fault. I, I have run, worked with the civil servants for probably more than virtually any politician around today. And I have the highest regard for them. They are a Rolls Royce. And if you think about a Rolls Royce, it is a brilliant piece of design and engineering. Left to its own devices, it won't go anywhere. It needs a driver and it needs fuel. That's what politicians provide. And if you start getting to the stage when the blob is used as a term of abuse in order to denigrate one of the absolute structures of our parliamentary democracy, then there is a terrible danger because they are not allowed to answer back. And of course, it takes the focus away from where the real problems are, which is the inability or the lack of willingness of politicians to do their job properly. And I see this, it's now, it's a very interesting extension of the Brexit disaster. Brexit was exactly the same situation. Them, foreigners, immigrants, Brussels, red tape, anything that diverts attention away from the real problems that we had, which was of course economic stagnation after 2008. Um, and the same people who use those arguments are now talking about the blob in order to explain, as they see it, the problems that we've got in this country, not just COVID, but Brexit. The, um, uh, the, the fulcrum of our politics is the House of Commons. Yeah and you are a master of the House of Commons, whilst also having a reputation for not being particularly clubbable in the House of Commons. How, do, how does one succeed in the House of Commons? I think the criticism of me is justified if you regard it as a criticism. Um, I, I took the view that uh, I was given a job to do and I would do it to the best of my ability. Yes, I was ambitious. I took the view that if I made a success of the job that they'd asked me to do, it would probably lead to preferment. What I was not good at, and I'm not good at, is sitting in a chair in a bar or in a coffee shop, smoothing my peer group. And it probably did do me harm, but it's not me. Do you, do you think you were right to resign? Roy Jenkins said to me uh, late in his life that he thought if he hadn't resigned as deputy leader of the Labour Party in, in 1971, he might have uh, become prime minister. That, and he said to me, as an almost invariable rule, he said, never resign, always stay in the arena. If he hadn't resigned, he said he thought he would have become chancellor in 1974 and then Harold Wilson's heir apparent. There is a view that if you had simply, I mean, as it happens, I agreed with you on the Westland issue, uh, domestic manufacturing capacity and defence and so on. But if you'd simply stuck it with Thatcher, you would have been the heir apparent and maybe that would have been a better course. Do you, do you ever think that? Uh, well, yes, of course. Uh, that would have been an option, but it wouldn't have been me. I was Defence Secretary. I happen to regard being Defence Secretary in any government, particularly a Conservative government, as one of absolute trust. And my father was a 
a soldier of distinction, and uh, I was brought up to respect and understand that. So being head of the British Armed Forces politically was a huge privilege. And the issue was not about a helicopter company. It was not about uh, um, some obscure manufacturing issue. It was very simple. Uh, I had been asked by the industry secretary, Leon Britton, to help him find a solution to the economic problems facing Westland. And I had done so by going to my European defence ministerial colleagues, with whom I had just concluded the biggest deal Britain has ever done, which was the development of the Eurofighter, and uh, to see if they would come forward with a proposal that would provide an alternative to solving Western's problem. The Americans had their own solution. And Margaret called a group of, a small group of ministers, perfectly properly, to discuss the two options. Um, she wanted the American one, and she wanted me to withdraw my European one. But my colleagues in the small group voted her down. So, rather indignantly, she said there will be a meeting of the Economic Committee of the Cabinet to discuss this matter. And she brought the chairman of Westland in to help the debate. She lost. And uh, my colleagues wanted the European version to be on the table. Uh, she summed up that meeting of the, cab of the Economic Committee saying, very well, we will meet again. And uh, the meeting was organized by the Cabinet Secretary for Friday uh, of the following week, later that week. Uh, it was organized, diaries filled, two days later it was cancelled. And so the next cabinet, I said, Prime Minister, I wish to raise this issue. We can't have this issue raised. I wish to present to colleagues the, the facts of the matter. We can't do it. And then she produced from her bag, and anyone who knows about politics knows that the silver servants have always produced a briefing note with all the options, because they've talked to everybody that provide the basis of summing up. She produced from her bag a piece of paper in which she had written out the conclusions of the cabinet that I was sitting in. And basically it said that anybody who is now ask questions about this matter, will refer the answers to the Cabinet Secretary. To which I said, are you saying, Prime Minister, that if I am asked by the journalists the same question they asked me 10 days ago, I have to say, well, <laughs> if, if you wouldn't be kind enough, I'll just ring the Cabinet Secretary and tell you what the answer will then be. Mm -hmm. This was the day of Bernard Ingham. I would have been crucified if I had agreed to that. I would have been made to look a man of straw. He took us all the way up. At the moment it came to a confrontation, he ran away. And I would have let down my European colleagues who had agreed a deal with me, which was by that stage led by two of Britain's biggest companies, GEC and British Aerospace. There was no place for me with honour as Defence Secretary, treated in that way. So I left, and I have always felt sad, but I have never had a moment's doubt that it was not something I could put up with. A, a last uh, question before I open to, um, to the floor. Uh, you were born in 1933, shortly after Hitler came to power. No, the day he came to power. The day he came to power? Yes. Awful, awful coincidence. He became, he was, the, the, it was 21st of March 1933. Uh, you, um, you've just told us that you became seriously interested in politics in your teens and when you went up to Oxford at the age of uh, 18, you were uh, engaged from day one. So you've observed the, 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 the trade of politics for 70 years and been a 
participant for most of that period. As you look back over those 70 years, who are the leaders you most admire? Harold and Mellon. T t tell us more. He told the people the truth. It, first of all, his record uh, in the 1930s when he wrote the book The Middle Way represented One Nation Conservatism. He had a distinguished uh, military record and uh, he became Prime Minister when we as an imperial power were fighting rearguard actions in Cyprus, Malaya, Kenya, across the globe to try and maintain the imperial presence. It was quite unsustainable, quite beyond the financial ability and indeed beyond the political will of this country to go on in those circumstances. And Macmillan's great speech, The Winds of Change, explained the changing circumstance, which was uncomfortable, but it was true. And he not only explained the uh, impossibility of an imperial power for us, but he pointed to a new destiny, the European destiny. And I believe that, believed then, believe to this day, that the role for this country is to be a major European power, exercising influence within the collegiate body of Europe on a world stage. And for, if I have one overarching criticism of this government, it is that they have left an empty chair in the corridors of European power. And I believe that a new generation of British people will come to resent bitterly this abdication of Britain's traditional role in the world. And a new set of leaders will emerge that will take us back to fill that vacuum. Well, there speaks the president of the European movement. Um, well, I primed Mr. Speaker Burko to ask the first question while others of you think of what questions you might like to ask, because I know that uh, John won't fail to uh, rise to the occasion and the microphone is coming by. I don't know if you need a microphone, John. I can't think of anybody who less needs a microphone than you. <laughs> Maybe for the streaming, it's, it's, uh, it's Thank useful. Thank you, Andrew, very much indeed. Lord Heseltine, that was an absolutely scintillating tour de force, which I rather imagine everybody here present has richly enjoyed. I wonder if I might be very cheeky <laughs> and abuse my position by asking two questions. First, because there was reference made to your alleged lack of club ability, which you did not deny, but which you explain by reference to the person that you are. I wonder whether you think, as is sometimes suggested, that if you had worked within the interstices of the system in Parliament by serving for a period as a whip, <laughs> that might have made that ultimate difference and you might have got to the very top of the tree. Of course, it's speculative, but it's perhaps a point of interest. And secondly, in light of what you just said at the end about it falling to a new generation to rejuvenate the appetite for a proper European role for Britain, I suppose that inevitably leads me to ask you, on my own behalf, but also on behalf perhaps of others, about time. And what, in your judgment, is a reasonable time frame within which, having built up, presumably, a head of steam and some properly coruscating criticism of the depredations of Brexit, might be reasonable for us to think about this country acknowledging, because there's no shame in making a mistake, only in failing to acknowledge the fact of having done so, acknowledging that we got it wrong and it would make sense to go back to the Union and say, can we return? On your first question, I think it would have been good for me to have been a whip. Not that I'm a very whippable sort of person, because uh, uh, it's not my strong, you know, you've got to be all things to all people and awfully clubbable and hands around people's shoulders sort of stuff. It's not really me. And so it, I've never felt any sense of grievance that no one invited me to join the whip's office. I mean, that, but, but I have no doubt at all that, that I would have learned things about the parliamentary party um, uh, that, that perhaps I didn't take sufficient notice of. If I had been the scheming, climbing adventurer that many people thought I was, but I, uh, I just got on with doing the job I thought I was meant to do. On your timing of Europe, I wrote an article in the Mail on Sunday, I think the Sunday after the referendum, the fight back starts here. To me, the fight back has already started. 
and I see the polls are now showing a 10-point lead to the Remain campaign. Um, so uh, where I think that <coughs> there has been, the government's had fortune, I don't want to say good fortune because COVID is not good by any standards, but has fortune in the sense that it, COVID has drawn a curtain over everything. And quite understandably, that's what everyone is preoccupied by. Their lives, their livelihood, their jobs, their social life, their holidays, whatever, their family, illness and, and all that. Uh, so what is actually going on in the real world is much less obvious. I think that is beginning to change. And I think by this time next year, it will have changed considerably. Uh, 1.3 million Europeans have gone home. And there are lots of people in care homes and in hospitals and in jobs and on the farms who are not going to get their jobs done because there's a gap. Um, and um, if you look at the investment profile of British industry, it's rather gloomy because companies are not investing in the scale that they need. Uh, now, all of this will become apparent, uh, particularly as... We, we're now reverting to the point where the tabloid newspapers can't find enough sort of abuse to heap on our European allies. It's all the old stuff, you know. Um, uh, so I think that the mood will change quite rapidly. When, on, on the specific of your question, when that actually turns to a decision to reapply, yeah, I think it's very difficult to see. Um, uh, I, I would guess, if you think back about how Brexit gathered momentum, it's over a very long period of time. It actually started in the 1970s, but it began seriously to get momentum towards the very end of Margaret's tenure and, and then through that period on to the 90s. John had great problems with the bastards, as we all know. Um, but all sorts of things were happening. Murdoch and Conrad Black owned the newspapers. Paul Dacre took over from David English as editor of the Daily Mail. Um, the 2008 crash, in my view, was the f absolute fundamental point because the, from that moment on, our economy failed to deliver and people were looking for change. And, of course, the essence of change is never to be too precise about how you're going to change because that enables your critics to explore what you're talking about. For example, we're meant to have had a bonfire of controls, Brussels regulation, tear it up, get off our backs, no red tape. Here we are five years after the referendum. How many red tapes have gone? Can anyone tell me of an example of some bonfire across Whitehall of all these red tapes? It was all rubbish. It was all I know because I was in charge of red tape for three years in government. I know, I know just how hard. And, uh, what what one has to uh, tell you what red tape is? It's the difference between civilization and the jungle. The jungle knows no morality. What civil servants do, at the behest of their political masters or mistresses, is to inject rules of behaviour which protect the weak from those who will abuse them, that will pre prevent cruelty, that will prevent hunger, that will prevent every manner of abuse which the jungle will do nothing to protect. That's what regulations are about. Yes, they are occasionally onerous. Why? Because civil servants have learnt the hard way that there's a tiny proportion of the population armed with the most excellent legal advice, always looking for any loophole to get through and abuse the system, and they try to stop them. That's what regulations are about. And to talk of a bonfire without defining any way at all what you mean by it is just one other example of the hypocrisy of Brexit. Well, you've just heard Tarzan on the jungle. Uh, we have a group of members of the Young European Movement here. I I'd like to give you the opportunity to come in. You may, you may like to give... Uh, Lord Hesseltine, your thoughts on forming political careers over the next generation? Who would like to ask Sam? Well, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. This was a really fascinating talk so far. And I, I just wanted to pick up on one of the last things you said when you were answering Mr. Speaker Burko's question about rejoining and the potential of that. Do you think it makes more sense for uh, those of us who wish that to be the end goal to focus on more modest achievements? I mean, rejoining the customs union, a closer economic relationship with Europe, to not antagonize Europe over issues surrounding immigration and perhaps rejoin, I, I ask this in question form, is not the immediate political goal? I have no difficulty with the idea of drawing closer to Europe and becoming formally associated with aspects of Europe, but always have in mind that you are not at the top table. You are not taking part in the big decisions of that affect us crime, immigration, climate change, industrial investment, uh, whatever it may be, you're not at the top table. And that's where you have set your sights. So if you want to sign up to some aspect or another as a stepping stone, I've got no problems with that. I see Andrew Harrington at the back, and then I'll work with through, around the room. Andrew. Talk. We are in, in present. Uh, we, we are in uh, the presence of two noble lords, and there may even be others in the room. If there are, I apologise. I'd like to ask Lord Heseltine um, how you see the role of the House of Lords in a modern democracy. Whether or not now is the time for reform, and if so, what reform would you make? You've only got um, a few minutes to answer that. <laughs> I <can't. laughs> Many well, people have spent I, centuries. I, I can answer it pretty carefully. If I was Prime Minister, I would put it on the back burner because there are so many things that need to be done in this country and changing the House of Lords won't actually ad advance the agenda that I would like to be ad advanced. Um, and you have to ask yourself basic questions. Are you going to have a second chamber that confronts the Commons? Well, you're not going to get the Commons to vote for that, but if that's what you want, think it through. Um, if you want the permanent deadlock that you could get, if you want one party controlling one, another controlling the other. All of these things, if you worked all that out and you think you'll be better off, well, that's a perfectly legitimate political decision. Personally, I can think of lots of things we need to do, and reforming the House of Lords is not one. I see a question in the second row, and then I'll move over to, to the other side of the, the room. Peter Wilson-Smith, Lord Heddlestein. Thanks for your talk. Can you give us your observations on what's um, happened to standards of behavior and conduct in the political sphere. I mean, it seems to me in the last few years, we've seen a dramatic change in perhaps not so much in what's considered acceptable, but what is accepted. And you've seen this on both sides of the Atlantic. Behavior, which a short while ago we would have considered completely impossible, is now normalized. Do you, do you feel things have changed significantly? I don't really. I think it's always been pretty bad. And uh, uh, it's just now much more scrutiny. Um, the, the ability of the, the internet to probe and to spread information is much more acute. And uh, the, the journalists are very professional. Uh, and I have no complaint about that. Um, but if you look back over history, there have always been these examples of terrible behaviour. I, I, let me say it once, I believe they are a very much a minority sport. My own experience of politicians is that the vast majority of them give a very uh, wholehearted commitment of a very high standard to the job that they do. And uh, um, I, 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 I've been in all sorts of positions where people could have tried to bribe me or bully me. No. I mean, this is a remarkable country, by and large. The idea of trying to bribe Lord Heseltine strikes me as, as deeply preposterous. Uh, Matt Kelly, who's the editor of The New European, which has been made a great contribution to British journalism, is at the back. And uh, Hi. Hi, Michael. Um, I, I grew up in Liverpool in the 70s and 80s, and attended the International Garden Festival you put in place to 
help rejuvenate a city that some of your colleagues was quite happy to, to run down. And I just wonder now if you have any thoughts on whether this government is sincere in its promises and obligations towards the north of England and reducing some of the geographical iniquities that might have led to the Brexit vote, for instance. Well, any, any day now we are going to get a white paper on devolution, so we're told. Um, that is two years late. Uh, we know exactly what needs to be done. It basically is a story which f first gained currency in 1968 with the publication of the Redcliffe Moore report. And that outlined how many local authorities that we actually need in this country, which is about 60. They should be unitary authorities, they should have directly elected mayors, and that would put us broadly on a parallel with every other advanced economy in the world. There should then be a significant shift of power, not to an absolute degree, any government's entitled to its manifesto being implemented, but to a point at which, in a very wide range of decision-making, power is shared in the sense that the decisions originate at the local level, where the circumstances that relate to that local level are taken into account and are done in a way that sees the community as a whole, the economy as a whole, as the area that you're seeking to improve or govern or whatever you call it. Whereas at the moment what we have is the baronies of power in Whitehall who make their minds up about decisions on functional issues, housing, education, skills, health, whatever it is, and then impose, regardless of the actual circumstances at the local level, their will. The most preposterous example of it the other day was a specific grant to clean chewing gum off the streets of local places. At a time when we're supposed to be strapped for cash, and you're trying to get local authorities or local communities to activate their economies for some Whitehall department to work out that 25 million or whatever it was should be devoted to cleaning chewing gum off the streets is preposterous. Um, but uh, so uh, there has been huge, well, very significant movement, which I give great credit. Well, Tony Blair did the mayor of London. That was good. David Cameron and George Osborne helped Greg Clark uh, to get mayors in uh, about six of the major conurbations. Um, uh, we have made some progress towards unitary counties, but nothing like enough, but they have very little power of their own and uh, they have no directly elected mayors. Um, and as I say, for two years, uh, the leveling up agenda that we heard so much about it has consisted entirely of announcements of transport programs, health programs, housing programs, whatever it is, all designed in London and imposed by the use of government money. Um, so uh, that's, that, that doesn't deliver the levelling up. But just one refinement, you use the word the North. I, I, I've never argued for levelling up with the North. I've argued for levelling up full stop. In other words, it, there are parts of Kent which have acute areas of deprivation. When I first got involved in this, the East End of London was a bomb site. So levelling up is about looking at individual communities and giving them their place in the sun. The opportunity to influence policy, the resources to help build on those policies, the, peop the, the creation of an infrastructure of people whereby local leaders feel they can achieve something and take a, a hand in their own destiny. That's what levelling up means. It, it doesn't mean that every whole of, London, whole of Britain is going to look like Belgravia. That would be silly. But it, 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 it does mean giving people the feeling that they have some degree of influence and control over the places and the economies in which they live. Uh, shall I take two questions together as we move towards the end? And then I have one question at the end, which I'd like to pose. Uh, the, the gentleman in the second row and then two rows back. Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether you felt that the Conservative Party that you joined uh, had been hijacked uh, 
Mm-hmm. And, and if so, can you see any current uh, Conservative MPs who might be one day in a position to overthrow and throw the uh, hijackers overboard? Well, I think one thing we can be absolutely clear about is that if I was to name such a person today, it would be the end of their political career. So I, I will spare them the embarrassment of being associated with me as one of the, I think, the only unwhipped member of the House uh, in the Conservative Party. Of all the people who lost the whips, I'm the only one who has never had it back. I'm, I'm not, I sleep at nights, so don't worry in any way on my account. Um, but but um, on, your, on your more substantive question, which was, uh, uh, has the party been hijacked? Well, the thing I know about the Conservative Party, it's the most successful political party in the history of human democracy because it likes power. And that's perfectly respectable. If you want to achieve something, you need the power to do it. And so the Conservative Party likes to win. And uh, if it, at the moment there is no doubt at all that it has moved to a position, particularly a Brexit-type position, um, uh, which uh, I think will explode in its face. And that very rapidly the party will adjust to that and it will find new leaders and new policies. It's been extremely good at doing it, never more so than in 1945. And then a, a final question at, at the back. Yes, please. Thank you very much, um, first of all, for an excellent talk. Um, and uh, um, I must say, um, your sort of summary of the merits of devolution was in itself fabulous. Um, there was a member of that coming, um, and apparently you, you're a file generation. I, I wouldn't necessarily hold your breath on that front. Um, but my question is the fact that um, as somebody who is a self-made millionaire, um, and but yet also... Um, everything from President of the Oxford Union um, to Deputy Prime Minister, um, and also somebody who in this talk alone has sort of spoken against those great sort of anti-populist shibboleths of the civil service um, and the EU itself. Um, have you ever considered yourself to be a member of um, an establishment or the establishment or variations thereof? And if not, um, why not? And, or if so, why so? Well, I, I must be a member of the establishment. I mean, what the heck am I, you know? I mean, I, 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 I have made a lot of money, and well, I have a, a company which is very successful, and if you add up the, what people think the shares are worth, it's a lot of money, but it doesn't mean money. It's all shares in companies, you know? But yes, I, I, I have made, uh, I am a wealthy person without any doubt, and I live in a wonderful grade one house. So what else do you call the establishment? Uh, I, I, I know... Lots of important people, even the odd cabinet minister. <laughs> I even know Boris quite well. He took on from me at Henley. We had a perfectly good relationship. So um, uh, what, is the, what is this thing, the establishment? It's just, it's just a sort of word, isn't it? Just a thing. But I, and I think you'd find it very difficult to define the establishment which excluded me. Oh, I'm a member of Whites. <laughs> <laughs> and then a, f- a final question to bring us back to the theme of, of leadership, because we, uh, we need to finish at, at seven sharp because of the streaming. You said that uh, the greatest leader of your lifetime was Harold Macmillan, who, of course, was a, a leader of this country. As you look internationally in your lifetime... Who is the best international leader that you've observed, do you think? Adenauer. Would you like to say a bit more about him? Well, I think to bring Germany back into the community of nations uh, in the way that he helped to do was a superhuman task. And to make Germany a a reputable colleague and um, part of the the resurrection of a new European destiny. He, he has to be a serious contender. Why do you think Germany has been so successfully governed? Because oh. Britain devised the system by which it should be governed after the war. <laughs> I think that's a brilliant note on which to end. The greatest success of, the, of British politics and government since 1949 hasn't been in this country, ladies and gentlemen. It's been the Federal Republic of Germany. Lord Hesseltine... Thank you very much indeed. It's been a real pleasure.